Hello and welcome to a brand new episode and a brand new podcast. This is World of Martial Arts. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Ant. Shall we begin? Coming up on this episode. We're going to the movies, well, virtually, as we take a look at Knuckle Dust, a brand new film featuring the father of parkour. I love this, but I still have the child mindset. Yeah. I'm feeling like I'm an adult, I can be responsible, but I still have that in my head. So everything for me is like, whoa, it's crazy. And after that, how about this? I hit him at that after about the eighth time I hit him that hard. I thought I'd broken his neck. I was like, ah, boom! And he just started laughing at me. And I was like, oh man, this is going to be a bad day at the office for me. That's our very own Mick Tully. Thankfully, not talking about his office job, but about the time he met Maul Morney to talk about Silat and Brunei. First up, we've been taking a look at brand new movie Knuckle Dust, and our very own Will caught up with one of the big names in the movie. Sebastian Foucan is the founder of Free Running and moved into acting in Casino Royale. You may just remember him being chased by James Bond up a crane. In this film, he plays the very stylish cowboy TikTok. And as well as talking about life in lockdown and the experience of being on the red carpet with Daniel Craig, he also told us about his process of getting into character. We'll hear from Sebastian in a moment, but first, here's a clip from Knuckle Dust. You die, or she dies. That's the deal we made. You broke another promise. And now, you both died a knife. Serena! Serena! I'm a, I'm a good person. But if I think about some, I don't know, I've got two daughters, but if I think about someone who did very something, who would do something bad to my daughters, ultimately it will, it will trigger a different part of me, the, the social and everything. So all the things like, we all have this in us, so we just have to be prepared and, uh, and uh, it's like kind of a warm up, you know, because if I'm joking with you and I, do, and I have to do my scene, I'm not really into this but if i prepare myself and i get into the mood and this is it we play but it's like bruce lee said we play but we play seriously so for me it's like it's always this idea of like try to find the the right um the right motivation that's what i did basically and uh it seems to work uh, get the intensity but but for me i always say it's always linked with the trust like the, the when you're on a set where Everyone tried to do something good. We try to come up with something good, but you don't feel a pressure. You know, it's like when you were kids, when you play with, with like you play with brother or friends or sisters, you like, it's like, um, you're free to do whatever you want. You know, no one will judge you. So if you prepare yourself properly, uh, I think you, you can always make mistakes, but you, you've, so you've got editing also, but you give your best. And then after you just finger cross because it's a creative process. So, you never know with a creative process. Well, the creative process is complete and you can see Sebastian as TikTok right now. Knuckle Dust is available on demand on YouTube and Amazon. And if you want to see the full interview with him, that's available at warmer.tv. We've all watched the film. Mick, let's start with you. How would you describe Knuckle Dust? Because it sounds like a straight fight film from the title, but it isn't really. There's so many different genres thrown in there. When it worked, it really, really worked. But it was like watching Showgirls, the movie, but with martial arts in it, and a little bit of PTSD as well. When I first started watching it, I was thinking, this looks like it's very stylized. It's like moments in it where they, you know, the screens are coming up and the titles of the characters. And I'm like, well, oh, this is very rock and roll, very Guy Ritchie. And then it just went, pew. And then it went off on a bit of a tangent. Then it came back. <laughs> but you know what? I actually enjoyed it. I thought it was quite amusing. You know what I said is it, it, it answers that burning question of what happens when you cast a familiar from Blade to play an English John Wick, right? And it, if you watch any movies from 1999 to 2003, or if you were reading like Japanese fiction back then, it has this kind of fever dream pace to it the whole time doesn't know what sort of genre it is the whole time, which to me winds up being actually enjoyable. Yeah, it's a little chaotic. I'd, I'd written the note of it. It's Boondock Saints meets Fight Club, directed by a Guy Ritchie super fan who sleeps with a Sin City poster above their bed. Right? That's exactly what it had me thinking. And I kept going, is this Pulp Fiction? 
is this Pulp Fiction? And then cue the gimp. Yes, absolutely Pulp Fiction, right? So it hits all, it checks all these different boxes that I wasn't expecting it to. Somehow there's, yeah, there's an animated interlude in it that it's like you're getting a, a little bonus feature out of it. The whole thing was, uh, like I said, kind of a, a fever dream um, amusement park ride from beginning to end. So I think late night watching is good. And I think I'm going to watch it a second time. I think the second pass will be a little different. I like to do that with these kinds of movies, just dip back in and see what it's like. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't watch it if I was looking to really dig into something, but it's definitely a fun time to have uh, something going on in the background or, you know, I liked it. Nathan, what do you got? What are you thinking? I mean, you two both just managed to skip over not describing the plot of the film. Okay, so I'm going to give it a go. It's about a, a club. It's a club knuckle dust where it's run by this woman in a slinky, like gold dress. And um, the business model seems to be a fetish sex club and also an underground fight club where people are betting online but one of these um conscripts one of these contestants in the fighting a veteran then decides uh well basically causes havoc he he rebels and starts fighting back and then the main thing from there is that it's it cuts to the police investigation of that and then cutting back and forth between that investigation and the carnage that happened in club knuckle dust um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I think because it's so ambitious and he throws so much in there, lots and lots of twists, huge number of named characters doing a lot of different stuff. Um, so it can be hard to follow at times. And in a, in a way, I would have liked him to streamline it a little bit. But what he did, I thought was great. The only thing that I was a little bit you know, like disappointed by that it's framed and looks like an action movie but it kind of shies away from the action. It tends to cut away from it a little bit. It tends to not really go for it. There's a couple of fight scenes in it, but you'd expect like a lot more action, but a lot of them are cut very short. Like the fight, you know, the action scenes will be all set up like a Mexican standoff or something and it'll end very quickly or it'll cut away to a different scene and then cut back. But there's a couple, there's the, um, the old boy style fight down a corridor and a couple of other good fight scenes in it. Uh, but overall, I, I did really enjoy it. It's, you, you know, all you guys have mentioned the references before, and it really does wear those on the sleeve. Like you can see what he's a fan of. I thought the plot was really ambitious, but had almost too many twists and turns. One thing I would like to draw attention to, and spoiler alert: the chosen weapon of one of the Kill Squad members is basically dildo nunchucks. Now, I don't know if anybody here has ever been hit by a dildo. A couple of times. But I'm not sure how quickly that's going to kill you. Speak for yourself, my friend. In honour of that unique weapon, how many dildo nunchucks out of ten would you give the film? I'm going to go with six. Dildo nunchucks out of ten could try harder next time round. Maybe take a little bit out of the plot. What are you boys saying? I'd go for a decent seven and a half. If not a little bit more, just because it was mad enough. I like mad films that sort of roll around and just it was it was entertaining and, and it just like it didn't didn't really ever stop. It just kept on going and I I like films like that. It's a nice sort of sprawl sprawling watch. Nice here. Kurt Cornwell, how many uh, dildo nunchucks out of ten? Clean seven dildos. Right out the box. <laughs> straight out. Straight out. Straight seven. <laughs> Nathan Leverton. Yeah, I've got to go the same. I've got to go with a six. I mean, you can't say it was a boring film. Um, I was definitely entertained, but there was too much in there. I would have liked to have seen it a bit stripped down. Um, so, yeah, a, a solid six. Ant McGinley? Sadly, I'm going to have to give it a mere four out of ten, which I believe gives Knuckle Dust an overall score of five and a half there's links in the show notes if you want to check it out for yourself next up we're talking about Silat and someone who's done a lot to bring the art to the rest of the world Mol Morney when people talk about Silat it usually conjures up images of Indonesia and Malaysia and lots of groundwork but when Mick met Mol Morney he found out that they do it a little differently in Brunei. I don't want them to touch me with the palm. Yes. If they can touch me with the palm, that means they can grab me. 
Yes. If they can grab me, again, in the, man, the mentality of the nobility in the olden days, I don't want you to touch me. Yes. You you are not my class to touch me. <laughs> so they have that caste system in the olden days. Yes. So no, noble blood, this, 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 in the olden days. Yeah. So that's why, uh, and the reason why I hit you in the floating ribs, yes. or the lower part, is so that you should always bow to me. <laughs> so yeah. if you're going to approach me, bow. Yes. Either by volunteering to do it, or yeah. I force you to bow. But who is Malmoni? Kurt, you've trained with him a couple of times, and Mick, you've had the privilege of meeting him as well for the interview. So how would you explain what he does, and how would you rate him? He's in my top five all-time wow moments in martial arts. When I just, the minute that guy puts his hands on you, he puts it on you, and you just go, I have no business being in front of this guy. But Marl didn't care about that. He talked about his art. He talked about the cultural references, about how they attack down a straight line and then they take you off the line because where they live, everything is on these little bridges because all the houses are on hooks that are on top of like, you know, water or marshland. And he says, yeah, you just throw them off the side. And I was like, wow. And then it's just amazing. You know, if you check him out on YouTube, he moves like you would like i'm a martial artist yeah and i've been doing it a long time and i used to be quite good it's one of those the older i get the faster i was but i look at him and i'm like that is what martial arts is supposed to look like and his weaponry work his machete work i know Kurt, kurt's trained with him you know i've just only ever interviewed him but we've got two clips there's one where i'm doing like this parrying bridge and a hack to his neck and he's like go 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 and literally I hit him after about the eighth time. I hit him that hard. I thought I'd broken his neck. I was like, ah, boom. And he just started laughing at me. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to be a bad day at the office for me. And then he says, oh, he goes, you do Thai boxing. And I'm like, yeah, he goes, Thai kicked me a few times. And this is no word of right. This is the moment. I, I started throwing in. After about the third one, he says, no, no, really put it in. And I made the biggest mistake you can make in martial arts, which is I was wearing trainers while trying to do a round kick while kicking a stationary object and not realizing that guess what my supporting leg wasn't going to spin round and i did put in three and he goes no kick me harder kicked him and what i did was i literally jarred my supporting leg and i brought this massive hematoma up on my shin and it was halfway back from london and I, I rang Will up and I said, so glad I drive an automatic, man, because I cannot move my right foot. So I had to drive all the way back with my foot on the accelerator with my left foot. And uh, Kurt, over here, we have the steering wheel on the right side of the car. You guys have that goofy <laughs> clown thing. But the other one, it was probably one of the most rewarding moments of my life when it came to martial arts and being able to do something for a friend of mine and it was for Kurt, and it was something that me and Maul did, and I let Kurt explain the situation a bit better. Wow. But the, the, that will, the, it just speaks volumes about the guy. The, in, the interview itself is great. I warn anybody who, who doesn't believe that Maul's any good, you will actually look at this guy and you go, he's so nice, you know, I'll spill his pint next time we're allowed into a pub, you know what I mean, if ever. But... You know, you'd be, he'd be the first guy that you would start a fight on because he's so nice. And my good God, that would be the worst mistake of your life. Yeah, that video is a, uh, that's a touching memory. I, I hadn't forgotten about it, but I haven't thought about it for a while. Um, my daughters were born three months premature. And so they lived in the hospital for a very long time, had a lot of very serious, scary complications. And during that time, Mick and Maul got together they made a little private video shout out for the girls to kind of send some good vibes and everything. And, you know, Mick and I have been very close for a lot of years now. So it wasn't that that wasn't surprising. It meant a lot, but it made sense. And then to see Maul as part of it, uh, somebody who's kind of a, a titan of the industry and the community and, and of his own art and everything. Uh, yeah, that was, that was pretty special. And that had Amariah, my wife and I pretty, uh, pretty in state for that. So that, that was great. I'm, I still have that on my phone. So thank you. Um, yeah. And I agree. Maul is easily, yeah, he's in my top three most wow moments of martial art and is uh, without a doubt, one of the uh, most humble figures that I've ever met. 
one thing about his art and the way that he presents it, you know, it's a family art and I don't want to uh, speak too much about the details of his art. One, uh, definitely watch the interview, but two, I don't want to misrepresent it, but it's a cultural art, a Bruneian cultural art. We don't see a lot of stuff from Brunei in general. And we usually think for sea lot in terms of, at least in the States, we think of Indonesia and Malaysia and maybe the Philippines, but uh, to see an art come out of Brunei is pretty great. And to have an opportunity to learn about a new culture, to learn about a new country for a lot of people that have maybe never really even heard of it, at least with American education, then uh, it's, it's a good opportunity to, to dip your toe in new water. He always presents it from that place that this is about my culture. I'm trying to share my culture and, and the customs and everything that um, take place where I'm from. And I really appreciate and find that interesting because the art moves specific to that culture as does every art. And a lot of times we, we maybe forget that point. We go, well, that wouldn't work in a ring or that wouldn't work on the street. But you forget that it's a very old method that was developed for specific purposes. Silat Sufi and Belladiri is this way. Like you said, in a place where a lot of the um, sidewalks are pedestrian bridges over waterways, you can't have a lot of movement. There's not a lot of opportunity to be running around or chasing or stick and move, that kind of thing. You're on this narrow walkway. So his art moves really close quarters. It doesn't really, uh, you're either all the way out or you're all the way in and all the way through. And then there's a lot of interesting techniques that are meant to get your body to crumple or to take away your ability to breathe so that when they throw you off the bridge into the water, well, good luck, you can't breathe and now you're in the water or they'll break your, a bone in your legs so you can't swim and they throw you off the bridge. So he uses or the art uses the environment as part of the art. And I think it can really educate all of us as martial artists to investigate that kind of thing and then look at our own arts that we practice and go, yeah, maybe I wouldn't use this in UFC or whatever, but why did they do it this way in Japan at that time when it was developed or whatever, whatever else you're looking at? Even in Filipino martial art, you see some that clearly are urban styles and some that clearly are more jungle community styles. They have to move differently for those purposes. So um, it can really teach you a lot about martial art as a whole. I had the same experience you did with kicking him, but it wasn't Maul, it was Eric Alia. Right. And so Eric is Maul's assistant and he runs the DC group and a great guy, great martial artist, equally humble, super funny. Um, and he, I have a video of it, I have to give it to you, but he had me kick him in the groin. And it's one of my favorite videos because it's the same thing. I had to do it three times because he kept going, no, kick me, bang, no, kick me, bang. And by the third one, I'm like, uh, okay. And I punted him so hard that one, my foot hurt. Two, I went, right, this is how you like, injure your ankle by kicking something this hard. And three, I was at that point concerned not just about his groin, but just his body as a whole. That's how hard I was kicking him. And he just stood there staring at me like, whenever you're ready, go ahead. So I don't understand how that works. And I think that's a separate component from their art. I think some of that is other Bruneian martial art that, is, uh, that they train that influences that. But I'm not positive on that. If you like Silat, or if you're like me, see, I like Ponatukan a great deal. And I love Silat, but I always say I'd like Silat a little better if there was more boxing, just more straight punching, uh, more straight up punching. And it turns out we already have that. It's called Ponatukan, right? Well... SSBD will kind of, if you're a Ponatukan person, will feel sort of familiar. The angling is different. It's hard to not get into Ponatukan mode when you're doing SSBD. It's different, but it's familiar. And the principles are often familiar. It's just the techniques are extremely direct. And so if you're a JKD person, I think there's something to that, that idea of um, not just being economical, but single direct attacks that are just going straight to the target of whatever's right in front of you. Or he'll do something like hit the body so you lower down so he doesn't have to punch up to your head. He'll make you crumple so your head's right in front of his fist. So whether or not you would use the art that way, I don't know, but it's a riot to train. It's a ton of fun. And you're being taught not just by one of the most talented martial artists in the world, but absolutely one of just the best people that I know. So many of them really fortunate to call a friend. We've had him here at my gym in Detroit where I'm at now a couple, I don't know, maybe three, four times. Um, and he's always the highlight of the year when he's here. It's such a delight. As far as the origin story goes, one thing to always remember with Maul is he's very 21st century as a personality because he's so humble. He didn't really want to teach anybody his art or he just wasn't going after that. His training partners wound up encouraging him to do it. And he wound up putting a video on YouTube for a partner of his that moved. 
And then somebody out in the middle of nowhere in Italy stumbles across this video on YouTube. And this is like the beginning of YouTube. This is maybe year one or two for YouTube even existing. So they didn't think anything of it. Some guy in Italy stumbles across this video and was like, who is this guy and what is this all about? And flies him to Italy to teach him the knife fighting techniques of Brunei. And the whole thing exploded from there to the point where now that's all he does is he's a full-time martial art teacher. He never tried to do that. We all forced it on him. Please keep teaching. Please keep teaching. So that's very rare in my opinion. That's kind of why I love him the most is, is he's not out there trying to hustle. We all hustled him into being our guy. You know, that, I think that's a pretty cool thing. The great thing about Mal, which I really liked, was as we as we were interviewing him, he was uh, on about why he'd come over to try, to study, and he explained uh, he explained the, the the deal that the Sultan of Brunei had, which, by the way, I think is a great way to to you know if you want to have a good society, you know you need great leadership. And what the Sultan of Brunei had was, yep, go and study wherever you want in the world. I will pay for everything. I will pay you to go there to come back all your tuition fees the only thing i ask is when you've finished and you've done all your traveling come back and settle in brunei bring it all back with you and i and i was in shock i was like no but i only hear about the sort of brunei having like a gold rolls royce you know you hear all these mad stories in the in the tabloids the, the more that sort of piqued my interest a bit more because then i started looking into brunei and culture and society and it, like for a country that's so rich, yeah, you know, there, there isn't that much disparity of wealth there. You know, it's pretty. It's almost like a utopia. And it, you can see why Mal is the way Mal is because it's like you, you, I can't work out why we have, where we don't all have at least something. Now, I think Mal is literally a a great representation of what that Bruneian culture is, and he's a great rep representation of martial arts and a man. And if you like, you can find the full interview on worldofmartialarts.tv. That's it for this episode, but we'll be back soon with another covering all things martial arts from all over the world. If you've enjoyed the show, please share it with someone you think will enjoy it too. Thanks to our guests, Sebastian Foucan and Mal Morney. Head over to woma.tv to see the full interviews. And thanks to the Woma gang, namely Kurt, Mick, Nathan, Will and myself, Ant. If you need to get in touch, you can email us at support at woma.tv.